basically solve this puzzle in order to create blocks. A block is cryptographically linked to its previous block, effectively forming a blockchain. And every block uh, can accommodate a certain number of transactions within the block, those transactions that have been exchanged on the underlying peer-to-peer -peer network of the blockchain. There are mainly two parameters that we can t tweak in these blockchains in order to change the throughput. So first of all, this is the block generation. So at what pace do we actually generate blocks? So how fast are blocks generated? And the second parameter is the block size, which basically says how many bytes of transactions can we fit into a block? So intuitively, if we increase the speed of the block generation time, for example, if you go from 10 minutes of Bitcoin to one minute in Dogcoin or even 15 seconds in Ethereum, we will get faster payments. That's quite intuitive. If we have a bigger block size, if we increase the number of transactions that we can accommodate within a block, we will get a higher throughput. However, the drawback is that we get a slow propagation on the underlying peer-to-peer -peer network. So why is propagation so important in nowadays open and decentralized blockchains? Well, the synchronization among miners in the network is crucial. So let's see here these, these couple of nodes. Let's assume they are connected through TCP IP, and these are miners. So they are solving the proof of work puzzles. So if one of these miners finds a block, he propagates this block to his peers, and those continue propagating this block. And while this propagation happens, it could be that there's another miner which actually finds a competing block, one prime, which competes with block one previously broadcasted. So that's an issue because this creates basically a network partitioning in the network. And this could be that there are not only two, but maybe three or n partitions in the network and several miners are competing for one block. So the issue is only one out of these three blocks can eventually make it into the blockchain. Only one of the three blocks that you've seen here can be in the main chain. And the two other blocks that will remain stale, these are lost efforts. These are lost efforts that of synchronization of the honest network. And the, the drawback of lost efforts is that an adversary will not have, have these issues of synchronization that the honest network, the, the honest mining network has. So an adversary will have an easier game in selfish mining, in dinner of service, and in double spending if the stale block rate of the network is high. To give you some real information about real data about the actual networks out there, you can see in Bitcoin there's about 0.4% of stay blocks. In Ethereum, this goes up to 7% almost. So there's a big difference depending on the network how high these lost efforts are. So on the qualitative side, we have quite well understood what happens if we increase the block generation time. Well, we get faster payments, but the security becomes worse. If we increase the block size, we, have, we know that the propagation uh, becomes slower and we get, again, less security. But this, this is the side where you want to be on, right? We want to have a higher throughput. If we make everything slower, well, it's quite obvious we get slower payments, faster propagation, and better security, but less usability. So on the qualitative side, these tensions have been understood very well. But what we wanted to understand in our work is the quantitative aspect. So which ones of the blockchains that are out there are the best in terms of security and scalability against a rational adversary? And these are our contributions. So first of all, we provide a quantitative framework that allows to compare the security provisions of different proof-of-work blockchains objectively. So we can say which blockchain is better than, uh, than the other. We account for two main attacks that are relevant in our setting, which is first double spending and selfish mining. And the interesting part is that we consider these under optimal adversary strategies. So the adversary that we consider is actually the strongest possible. In order to not only capture Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, and so on, we developed an open source blockchain simulator that allows us to reparameterize different blockchains. So we can capture any reparameterization in terms of block generation time, block size, network propagation. And our simulator is scalable to thousands of nodes, so it can be actually representative of a real deployment. 
to give you a, a, like a hint of our findings, so a few key findings that we found is that we can scale Bitcoin by a factor of 10 in terms of transactions per second without sacrificing security. We can compare objectively different blockchains. For example, we find 37 Ethereum block confirmations are equal to six Bitcoin block confirmations. We show that selfish mining is not always a rational strategy. I will explain later why. And we show that the higher the block reward of a blockchain, the higher the security of the blockchain. This is in particular important if the block reward goes down in the future or if there's a halving of the block reward. So how did we do that? So what we developed is a quantitative framework in order to, to, to assess the security of a proof-of-work blockchain. So the first component is actually a proof-of-work blockchain. This is instantiated with several parameters, for example, the block generation time, the block size, the network parameters, and so on. And what's important to point out is that this can be a real blockchain, like a real deployed blockchain, or a simulated one. And the simulator that we developed captures a couple of important consensus and network layer parameters. So on the consensus side, we capture the block interval distribution, the mining power distribution of the miners, the block size distribution, the geographical location of the nodes and the miners with the up and down link and the latency in the network. The, we capture the number of connections, of TCP connections that a miner or node might have. And we implemented over four propagation methods those that are actually currently implemented also in Bitcoin. So the output of a proof-of-work blockchain is typically the propagation time. So there's Deckard, I'll have made a great work to explaining how we can measure propagation in these peer-to-peer -peer networks. And we have the throughput. But the key output of a proof-of-work blockchain is actually the stale block rate, because this somehow quantifies how efficient the communication in the honest network is. And the state block rate is what we use then in our second component of the framework, which is the security model. So in the security model, we have as input parameters, for example, the adversary mining power, so how much computing power the adversary has, the connectivity of the adversary, so how fast can the adversary push his blocks to the network, um, the impact of mining attacks, so how easy an adversary can basically partition the network, uh, mining costs, and the number of required confirmations for transactions. And the key, the key contribution that we have here in the security model is that we capture optimal adversarial strategies for selfish mining and for double spending. So this is the strongest possible adversary in the security model. We do this based on Markov decision processes. And to give you an intuition about MDPs, I will explain to you uh, here in the following. So MDPs are based on Markov chains. So if you have a Markov chain and you add actions, rewards, you end up with a state space and an action space. So, and this is one possible explanation how to, how to model a blockchain. So you can see the dark blocks are basically those that are published in the network. The red ones are those that are non-public. So the adversary currently has a non-public chain of three blocks. So this is the state three for the adversary. And the open and public chain is one block. So there's one honest block of the honest chain. So what the adversary can now do, he can choose an action. So he can choose, for example, the override action. So he overrides the honest chain by publishing two of his secret blocks. So he effectively kills the one public block of the honest network and gets a reward of two because he has two blocks that he published, so two block rewards for him. If then the honest network continues mining, it might adopt the adversarial chain because it was the longest chain at this moment. So this was to give you an intuition of how we use MDPs. For the full details, I would refer you to the paper. So now I'm going to present you our findings. So specifically, Ethereum and Bitcoin. How can we compare them? So we used our security model. We took the state block rates, and we computed basically what, are the, how, what is the comparison. What we, can com what we can see is that Ethereum has a smaller block reward in terms of US dollars. And it has a much faster block generation time, 10 minutes versus 15 seconds in Ethereum. 
And given the higher stair block rate of nearly 7% in Ethereum and only 0.4 in Bitcoin, we have found that against an adversary of 30% of the hash rate, we need 37 blocks in Ethereum in order to match the security of six block confirmations in Bitcoin. So this, these are many more blocks in Ethereum, but since the block generation time is so small, it's, it only accounts for 10 minutes in Ethereum and 60 minutes in Bitcoin. Another find, so another possibility is to quantify, obviously, the, the, the security for other blockchains like Litecoin, Dogcoin, or any other reparameterization that you can think of. So here, just 28 Litecoin blocks would be equivalent to six Bitcoin blocks. 47 Dogcoin blocks would be equivalent to six Bitcoin blocks. So what about double spending in general? So what we noticed is that the profitability of an adversary depends on the transaction value. So the higher the transaction value, the more likely an adversary will double spend. And what we quantify is the resilience against double spending with a double spending threshold. So this double spending threshold basically tells us when should I on mine honestly and when should I mine not honestly. So you can think of if you see the blue line, which represents um, adversary with 10% of the adversary hash rate. On the x-axis, you have the stale block rate. On the y-axis, you have the double spending threshold. So everything above the blue line, there the adversary will likely double spend. A rational adversary will double spend. Everything below, honest mining is more profitable than double spending. Okay? So we can basically quantify if the stale block rate grows that the the double spending threshold goes down and this is this is just an inset, like it's an it's an objective measure to see when an rational adversary would perform a malicious action or follow the honest mining protocol Another finding that we have is the number of required confirmations in Bitcoin. So we plot this here uh, against the adversary mining power on the x-axis and the necess necessary number of block confirmations on the y-axis. We consider three transaction values, 1,000, 10,000, and 100,000 US dollars. And what we can see, for example, uh, six confirmations are sufficient for 100,000 US dollar transactions in Bitcoin. Okay? So for most transactions, you might not need to wait six transactions. Another finding that we found is we wanted to improve the throughput of Bitcoin. So how would we do that? Given our open source blockchain simulator, we took the block interval and the block size and we reparameterized those in different, in different settings. So we, we were changing the block interval from 0 0.5 seconds to 25 minutes in discrete intervals and the block size from 100 kilobytes to 16 megabytes. And we made all possible combinations of those put them into our blockchain stimulator and measure the outcoming stale block rate. So the stale block rate, as I mentioned before, gives us an ability to measure how efficient the communication works in the peer-to-peer -peer network. And what we found is that at the one megabyte block size and the one minute, minute block interval time, the stale block rate does actually not increase substantially compared to the nowadays stale block rate. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that we can actually go from the current seven transactions per second in Bitcoin to more than 66 transactions per second without sacrificing security. So with only one parameter change of the underlying blockchain, we can scale by a factor of 10. So another, um, I want to speak a bit more about selfish mining, so the influence of stale block rate on selfish mining. But before I go into selfish mining, a brief recap of what selfish mining actually is. So it has been proposed by A.L. Zira in a seminal paper. And the idea is that an adversary is mining a hidden block without publishing it. And at some point, the adversary just published this block, cancels out some other blocks that have been uh, pub uh, published before by the Honest Network, and he gains more block rewards. So the, advers the advantage for the adversary, oh, the advantage for the adversary is that the other miner, the other miners perform wasteful computations because they are losing block rewards. The adversary, however, has a risk because he loses block rewards if he's not fast enough in propagating blocks, if he's not fast enough in finding blocks. So it's not always a rational strategy. 
So selfish mining allows an adversary to increase its relative revenue. This is what you can see on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, you can see the development of the stale block rate. So what we see is that the higher the stale block rate of a blockchain is, the higher becomes the relative revenue of a selfish miner. Respectively, we plot this here for an adversary with 10 and 30% of the adversary hash rate. Another interesting uh, insight that we got from our work is that selfish mining is not always a rational strategy. If we would mine a thousand blocks under a 30% selfish miner, so 30% of the hash rate harvested by the selfish miner, we would mine 209 blocks instead of 300 blocks under our optimal strategy. So obviously that's not rational. It's much preferable to, to, do, uh, to do honest mining in this setting. And AL and zero strategy yields on average a few blocks less than the, our optimal strategy. So under a constant difficulty of a blockchain, it doesn't make sense to do selfish mining. So as a summary, we proposed a quantitative framework that allows to compare objectively different blockchains. So we can compare, we can give you numbers on the security provisions of Ethereum, Bitcoin, Litecoin, or on any other reparameterization. We have shown that selfish mining is not always a rational strategy, and double spe when we propose a double spending threshold that allows you to quantify how many con block confirmations you need to wait for a given transaction value. We have shown you the block confirmation equivalence of different blockchains. And we have shown that the higher the block reward in US dollar, the more resilient it gets against double spending. Very important for block halving events, for example. And we have shown you how you can scale Bitcoin by a factor of 10 with only one parameter change and without sacrificing any security. Thank you very much. Okay, we have uh, microphones for questions. While people are coming up to the mic, I'll just throw out the first one. Um, so you say the higher the Brock reward, uh, the more resilient it is against double spending. How does this relate to uh, the paper in the next session um, that you might have seen from uh, uh, Princeton? Um, so, so as far as I know, they say that if the block rewards goes to zero, well, the, the stability of the blockchain is not preserved, right? right. Um, I mean, totally makes sense. It's exactly in, in accordance to our result. Yeah. Okay, great. There's no... Yeah. Hi, uh, this is Pratik from NUS. Um, the simulation that you're doing uh, clearly kind of highlights towards an idealized uh, network, right? Where the transmission rates between all the links are, are certain values. Have you uh, done real measurements to check whether your simulation matches that of the real Bitcoin or the Ethereum network? And uh, what have been your findings? Very good question. So uh, clearly, the simulation is a simulation. It's not a real deployment. And um, we cannot guarantee with 100% certainty that this is actually a real result from the reality. However, what we have seen with the simulation is that we can measure, what we measured is, is the data points that we get from the real networks that are deployed out there. So respectively, there's Bitcoin. We get a lot of data from there. There's Ethereum, there's Litecoin, there's Dogcoin. And we matched all the results of these existing systems with those from our simulator and compared if they make sense or if they don't make sense. And so far in our research, it made sense. So there was no ambiguity between the real deployed systems and those that we simulated. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Lloyd Liu from National University of Singapore talking about a secure sharding protocol for open blockchains.